Okay, hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are talking about Drive My Car, a beautiful movie. I will do my best to break it down, but if you haven't seen it, it's well worth a watch. And I would actually consider this film an instant classic. So directed by Rasuke Hamaguchi and based on the short story by Haruki Murakami, Drive My Car follows Yusuke Kafuko, a renowned stage actor and director, as he struggles to come to terms with his wife's sudden death. At face value, this appears to be a film about a man coming to terms with his wife's past. However, through his wife's death, the movie kind of explores the relationship between love and death. In losing his wife, Yusuke loses himself. Although alive, he might as well be dead. The only way he's able to continue on living with his wife is through a recording of her voice. This recording basically fuels any desire he has left to live. Every day he's driven to and from work with her voice in his head. Thinking only of what could have been, Yusuke's tormented by all these what if questions. So he's, he always thinks about like, what if I confronted my wife? What if I handled these infidelities better? What if I came home early that night? Like he, he's so paralyzed in the past and those thoughts remain uninterrupted until he meets Masaki. A young woman grappling with the same feelings of grief and guilt about her past. Gradually, he starts opening up to her, and not because he wants to, but because he has to. Despite Yusuke's belief, his wife's death did not terminate his ability to love, and together they, they are able to regain touch with their emotions and let go of their attachment to the past. Yusuke loved his wife, and the tape is a testament of that love. So, although she's not on screen with us, She's still another character, right? You feel her in the car with everyone else. She makes the car ride not only, you know, bearable, but comfortable for everyone, including the audience. And Yusuke and Misaki's sort of mutual trust for this bright red sab shows that although, you know, sometimes our loved ones are not able to physically occupy the passenger seat of our vehicle and in our hearts, that doesn't mean that no one else can. And, you know, the lesson of this movie, I believe, is that the road ahead might be difficult, but, you know, life doesn't end with rejection or death. And a lot of the times people look back and they think about all the things they could have done, would have said, could have said. But, you know, towards the end of the movie, they make the point without it being in your face that, you know, the show must go on in so many ways. And I liked how they use driving as kind of this metaphor for like taking control of your life and, and pushing forward, you know, like, like really taking control of your own freedom. And you gotta keep moving. You know, the past is something that can inspire you. It shouldn't be something that like haunts you. And so we'll start up, you know, again, I'll do my best to break it down. If you watch the movie and you have your own observations, I'm happy to hear them. So the film opens up and we're introduced to Otto and Yusuke and they're together in bed. And it's very important that we're introduced to them in this setting because right away you see the degree of intimacy that they have with one another. And Otto is reciting a story about a schoolgirl who has this obsessive crush on her classmate. In the story, the young girl basically plots to break into her crush's home, leaving you know trinkets behind in hopes that this guy will notice her one day. And it, as she's telling her story, her husband keeps offering suggestions. And at first I didn't know what these suggestions were for. And then I realized the stories that Otto is reciting, like they're her screenplays. And he basically helps her edit these screenplays so that they're adaptable for screen. And so Otto is a screenwriter and she's a former actress. And Yusuke is a director and a stage actor. So. Some background on these characters, they lost their daughter to pneumonia. And after losing their daughter to pneumonia, Otto basically quits acting and turns to screenwriting. And most of her stories come to her during sex. And this is not something I clocked until the second viewing. So it's a bit confusing at first. And the issue is not only do her stories come to her during sex, but she forgets her stories the next morning. So her husband basically helps her kind of remember them and she writes them down. And the ritual of sex and storytelling is really brilliant because we've always heard the saying like art imitates life. 
But in this film, art literally like embraces life. So the two become indistinguishable from one another, right? And I really like that commentary quite a bit. So Otto and Yusuke's sort of backstory is a prologue. So they, instead of giving us flashbacks, they kind of show us, you know, the events leading up to her death to better understand Yusuke's grief. And in addition to screenwriting, so Otto really suffers with the loss of their daughter. And it seems their daughter's death pretty much ended their happy times. And so she starts having affairs with other men. And one of these men being Koshi Takatsuki. And he is a young charismatic actor. And he's one of the few people while you're watching the film, like he grieves for Otto like she was his wife. You know, he's the only one visibly upset by her death. And so Yusuke first, first meets Koshi backstage at his show. And again, a lot of this movie, like there's so many subtle things that are expressed in gestures and you could see it right away. So he's meeting Koshi with his wife for the first time. He's smiling, you know, and it's important that he's kind of disrobing his costume, right? And he kind of stops taking off his costume when Koshi walks in as if to say like, oh, you know, like I, I got to keep performing, right? So as soon as Koshi leaves with his wife, he kind of throws down his vest and then you get the sense that his performances extend off screen. And this is a point made clear when he, his flight is unexpectedly delayed. So he's going on a business trip and unfortunately his flight is canceled. So he comes home early and he comes home early to find his wife with another man. And not only is he looking at his wife, but he's looking at himself dead in the mirror. And rather than confront like either, he just runs away. He's like, you know what? Nope, I'm not ready for this. And he pretends like everything is okay. There are so many hints that although Yusuke doesn't have the confidence to sort of confront his wife right away, he does, he does want to confront her in subtle ways, right? So in, during one of their encounters, he's with his wife and she kind of, he grips her the same way that Koshi was gripping her. And there's a scene where you can see Otto's face, his wife's face while they're making love. And her face just drops, right? She knows immediately like, ooh, he knows. So during this encounter, so this is a very critical encounter that they have. She continues to piece together her screenplay. So throughout the film, there's the story that's being told. And then we don't know how the story ends until the end of the movie. And so the story which begins about a girl with this crush on her classmate who kind of sneaks into his room she kind of continues the story and in this encounter she compares the girl to a lamprey which is sort of a parasitic animal that latches on to other animals in order to survive and so she, instead of this lamprey kind of clinging on to another fish it clings on to a rock and as it's clinging onto the rock, of course it dies and it has no memory of death. And she kind of compares this girl's obsession with her crush and going to this room to this lamprey, right? This girl is attached to this room as if to say she can't and she will not live without him, right? The obsession runs that deep. And here's where the story gets complicated. So in this part of the story, she describes the schoolgirl as once again breaking into her crush's home and while she's there she's so overwhelmed with feeling that she starts to like you know she she she, she stays there a bit longer than she should and then an intruder walks in and that's where the story ends so we have no idea who this intruder is how her story ends what goes on and the next morning it's really interesting because as i, as I said otto is a screenwriter and she pieces, like her husband helps her remember her stories. And this story in particular, he pretends like he doesn't remember, right? So they wake up the next morning, he's researching lampreys. And when she asks him, hey, like, do you remember the story I told you last night? He goes, nope, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he goes off to work. And this triggers her to kind of pull him aside and say, hey, you know what? We need to talk. Like, nah, enough's enough. So leading up to her death, Otto gives Yusuke a recording of un Uncle Vanya so he could practice his lines. So Yusuke is very attached to this bright red sap and he kind of rehearses in the car on his way to and from work. And so his wife does a recording of the play that he's currently starring in, 
kind of to fit his way of you know practicing his lines and he takes it and during the film this tape keeps her presence alive and it's really eerie because a lot of the lines that is being played through this tape literally mirror what's going on in Yusuke's life and this is a point made very clear you know both at, in the prologue and at the end of the film so just before finding his wife's body Yusuke is reciting the same lines that he would be performing at the end of the play basically bidding us all a quiet farewell so before his wife die, dies he's listening to Uncle Vanya he's like listening and these same lines are the same lines that you know at the end of the play and so that was just a wonderful touch kind of like you know quietly like his wife died unexpected unexpectedly and he kind of leaves us you know he there's no goodbye at the end watching Otto and Yusuke's relationship a lot of things are made clear first you know from the outside looking in their life seemed ideal you know they have muji furniture like they seem like very compatible sexually um, creatively, individually, they're just two people that fit. But beneath the surface, it seems like Yusuke had a blind spot. And he assumed this blind spot were his wife's infidelities. And this is a point that's made really clear when he's diagnosed with glaucoma. And in the movie, the doctor explains that glaucoma is a disease that they don't know what triggers it, they don't know where it's from, they don't know. They don't know. And in Yusuke's case, you know, it's appropriate because his blind spot is himself. And you see this by how much regret that he has, right? He, he keeps saying, you know, what if he came home that night? You know, could he save them? Could he save her? What if, what if he just like, instead of her initiating the conversation, what if he just initiated the conversation? And what scares Yusuke the most is, and what he's afraid of is, okay, let's just say I was able to have this conversation with my wife you know how would i act if i could not forgive her you know what would my reaction be because up until this point he's very controlled and he the line between acting and himself just gets totally blurred and so we fast forward two years later and we meet yusuke and it feels like only yesterday and although it fast forwards two years you feel like you're in the depths of like grief with him like it, it feels like he's paralyzed like that's the feeling you get just right off the bat. And so the credits roll and you learn that he's taking a new position as a director in Uncle Vanya. So he starred in this play before, but now he feels like he can't take on this challenge. He can direct it, but he just doesn't have the strength to put himself through that sort of character again. And the, the position is for a few months, but the most important thing to note here is that he's not permitted to drive himself to and from work. And the logic, the argument they give him is that previously an actor had kind of, you know, killed someone in a hit and run. And for that, they have this policy that they don't let the people that they work with drive themselves to and from work. And this is a point that we later find out is not true, right? Because he, he spots Koshi driving his car at some point. So he's like, wait a minute, that was a lie. And here we meet Misaki. So the first encounter between Masaki and Yusuke is so perfect because it really speaks to the fact that sometimes what's unsaid is more powerful than anything that could possibly be said. So as soon as he looks, looks at her, you can't tell if he's horrified because she's a woman or that she's young. Like there's just, you can read it on his face and he's both like not impressed by her and he's very concerned. So he kind, they kind of managed to convince him to just a test drive okay like if you don't like her then we can talk but for now you got to give her a chance and after the test drive he had nothing to say he was totally speechless he doesn't comment on her driving and instead he kind of just accepts her as his driver and this is a beginning of you know a relationship that would only be expressed through action right their respect for one another is expressed by action they don't they don't just say they they do you know like one gesture is sort of like they kind of mirror each other's energies you could say Yusuke is you know now he's settled in and he has to cast his play and this was something that was very confusing to me at the start of the film I didn't really understand it and then I ha I've watched it three times and the second time I understood so his plays are multilingual and so to have a multilingual play within a foreign film is like 
like it's kind of like crazy because it speaks to the limits of language you know it kind of invites the audience to consider like you know what what is you know what wh why is a foreign film a film like what makes something foreign you know and in a world of google translate you know language barriers seem like a thing of the past or at least they're not as big of a deal as they once were and you know having a multilingual play within a foreign film i think really speaks to the fact that language in itself is just a very insufficient way of sort of an insufficient way of judging people categorizing people and especially in terms of enjoying art and this is easier said than done like i'm not sure how as an audience member i would take watching a multilingual play you know like with subtitles and you know it, it invites the audience to do some work which is not something that we're used to right we're used to things kind of spelled out for us so it's a very dynamic way of doing things because it forces you to really be present in order to understand what's going on during one of my favorite auditions Lee Sonne uh, uh, auditions for the part of Sonia and this is an actress that auditioned entirely in Korean sign, sign language and I had no idea what she was saying but it hit me like her performance was the best and she had probably two or two like one of the best scenes apart from that audition the dinner scene of like this entire film and again it speaks to how insufficient language is in terms of like conveying and communicating emotions to people and just furthermore like thinking about the movie like in many scenes like the dialogue has actually nothing to do with what's going on or like the drama on screen you know the drama is unsaid and you see this when Yusuke cast casts Koshi as Uncle Vanya a part that you know clearly he's not right for and also this man slept with his wife so he shouldn't be in the play at all and Koshi is a good actor you know in that audition that was one thing that was made clear that he was very dynamic so the cast him in a part that he's ill suited for you know shots fired so you know beneath the surface you kind of get a sense that Koshi is taking it because he wants to connect with uh Yusuke to, to learn more about his wife and then on the flip side you know, it seems like Yusuke resents Koshi and I feel he resents him. Like by casting him as the lead actor, he's basically saying, you know what, you were good enough to take my place in the bedroom. Why don't you do so on stage? Like there is that shade to it, I felt. And it's a shade that he, he just keeps throwing. So as the play develops, his relationship to Masaki and Koshi develops. So with Masaki, it happens naturally, whereas with Koshi, it's by force, right? and with Masaki like watching both of these relationships develop you know parallel par in parallel is really interesting because there's one scene when Yusuke is late after an audition and he notices Masaki sitting outside and he says okay well next time I'm late and it's cold outside feel free to wait in the car and at first she kind of rejects the offer and her reason is she doesn't want to worry him she knows that this car is something that he loves and he has taken care of and she doesn't want to risk worrying him about the condition or if someone's eating in his car you know and he goes listen the fact that you understand that tells me that you most definitely should be waiting in the car and so you know every time they're about to connect she plays the tape and you see that throughout the film where Masaki is trying to keep like a delicate balance between them you know like a respectful kind of barrier between driver and passenger and so while she's trying to toe the line Koshi is just trying to tear it all down you know Koshi's like we need to talk so in their first of two outings Koshi offers to take Yusuke out in an effort to learn more about the woman he loved and Koshi is an open book you know he admits that he loved his wife he admits that he's obsessed with Yusuke saying he googles him frequently and that's how he found out about the audition and Yusuke is just sitting there like okay and he Koshi basically admits to Yusuke that his goal in auditioning for the play is to feel again and he hasn't felt anything since Otto's screenplay or since Otto's death and coming from him it's rich because Koshi has a reputation for being kind of a hothead and you see that throughout the film like eventually it explodes but he's someone who just wears his heart on his sleeve and he kind of he acts before he thinks and 
the like watching them side by side like they could not be more different right their views on sex their views on relationships their views on everything you know koshi really looks childish he looks almost juvenile next to yusuke and then you, you kind of have to wonder like what did otto see in him the more that koshi insists again this outing these auditions he's trying to open up to yusuke but yusuke is just not having it he's like listen like i don't even know he doesn't even know why he cast him in this play during rehearsal again like yusuke keeps calling koshi out saying you need to just read the lines and everybody in the cast is annoyed that's the thing about this play in particular like they're just rehearsing the lines and so one of the cast members is like listen this would be a lot easier if we knew what you wanted and then he goes you don't have to do better you know you just have to read the lines and at first they're like well that was passive aggressive but one of the films one of the questions this film asks is what exactly makes a great performance like what is the barrier between actor and audience and how do you break that barrier the actors the problem with the actors in uncle vanya is that they're kind of doing what yusuke they think yusuke wants to see and a lot of that has to do with the fact that yusuke just refuses to communicate anything besides read the lines and having a Chekhov play is really interesting because he's one of the few sort of playwrights that really do a good job of sort of capturing these human emotions kind of trying to articulate what can't be said and you know this is a tough text and so for Yusuke in this context the key to a great performance is understanding the lines well enough that they kind of flow through you you know instead of mimicking or pretending to feel emotions he wants them to understand it enough that they don't have to pretend or act out the words you know the words will come out of them naturally and that's a really interesting commentary on acting you know like what is the line between authenticity and fakery you know like i think to get a good performance like something real has to come out of you you like you can't fake certain emotions you have to really kind of understand what you're saying and you, there has to be a degree of vulnerability in the actor themselves to portray that emotion and that's yusuke's point right like yusuke currently doesn't have the vulnerability to play uncle vanya but apparently neither does koshi so the ability to express complex emotions that can hardly be put into words is beautifully expressed during a dinner scene when the barrier between passenger and driver unexpectedly sort of breaks down so up until the dinner scene it seems masaki and yusuke have a very sort of i don't know like what stays in the what happens in the car stays in the car you know they have a mutual understanding and even just before they go in to the dinner scene like you know they're having a conversation about whether or not masaki should attend so again whether it be coming to dinner whether or not she should stay in the car whether or not you're allowed to smoke like these conversations happen between them you know like nobody else sees and th th they have this very nice quiet understanding and so during this dinner scene i think probably besides koshi's sort of monologue is the best scene in the movie so we find out that the actress who plays sonia is married to somebody in the theater production and so they're kind of looking at them like oh that's why you know korean sign language because that audition was quite peculiar because he was really like his wife was acting but he was like acting with her like he was really delivering those lines that she was sort of communicating in korean sign language but that's a whole other conversation so during this sort of conversation yusuke asks lee sonae like hey why did you audition for the play and she kind of reveals the fact that she was a dancer and she had a miscarriage and the miscarriage pretty much paralyzed her ability to move you know to move like she she lost the willpower to just do anything and so like koshi she's hoping that she can feel again and she kind of thanks yusuke for giving her an outlet you know being like thank you i can move again and then she adds another part saying listen i may be using korean sign language but i'm not dumb you know like i do notice first of all you treat me differently and she makes the point by saying you know i can read a lot more than words like i can see in your eyes that you feel you have to treat me differently which is the same 
right? And, you know, when you don't have the capabilities as what, what seems normal in society, people do treat you differently. And she's saying, listen, you don't have to treat me or ask me questions that you don't ask anybody else. You know, it's condescending and it's rude. That's basically what she was saying. And Yusuke sitting there and Masaki sitting there like, oops. And so to break the ice, her husband asks her, so what do you think of Masaki's driving? And I think something about the transparency in that conversation prompts Yusuke to like, you know, answer honestly. And he says, listen, I feel like I hardly feel gravity. I forget that I'm in a car. And that compliment was just so spot. Like I was blushing for Masaki. I was like, wow. And Masaki, she didn't know how to take it. You know, she just gets up from the table. She goes and plays with the dog. She doesn't know what to do with herself, right? And, and from that, like this kind of formality breaks between them. And, and they're kind of on the same page, right? Like you get the sense like, like something, like something broke. So on the way home, this is the first time they're having a heart to heart conversation with one another really kind of like getting to know each other. And Masaki basically says, listen, um, now that you mention it, I'm really curious about your play. And she says, you know what? I thought she played a different part. You know, like she was kind of really inquiring about this play and he goes, you know what? Maybe you should just come watch. And automatically her instinct is to kind of put the barrier between them, right? Be like, okay, maybe I should play this tape. I might be out of line. And he senses that nervousness and he kind of meets her where she's at and he, he kind of reaffirms what he said. He said, listen, I'm not being fake with you. I appreciate your driving. And not only does he compliment her again, he kind of probes her, right? So she expressed interest in him, which automatically prompts him to express interest in her. He's like, you know what, now that you mention it, I am wondering where you learned to drive. And here we get insight into Masaki's past so her mother taught her how to drive and she has a very bad relationship with her mother. So her mother used to, she used to drive her mother to and from the train station. And on the way home, her mother used to beat her if she woke up in the back seat, which means Masaki had to drive in a way as to not disturb her mother who was resting in the back after coming home from work. And so this pressure kind of taught her how to drive smoothly and even like the worst conditions. And Masaki has this love-hate relationship with her mother where she's like, you know what? I respect her for what she did, but I hate her guts. You know, she taught me well, but she also scarred me at the same time. And this sort of honesty, you know, in terms of the car itself, like the way the car, like you feel more intimate in the car, like as the movie goes on, you feel like you're in the car with them. Like you feel like you're experiencing these very special sacred moments. And there are very few scenes that break up these special moments, right? Because the tape, Masaki, Yusuke, they're just like, you, you, it's almost like you're driving with them. And one of the scenes that disrupts the entire sort of vibe of the car is when they're driving to work and he spots Koshi, you know, driving his vehicle. And they're both looking at each other like, oh shit, like you weren't supposed to see me. I wasn't supposed to see you. And Koshi, I guess in a panic, gets into a car accident of some kind. He's late. That audition is a, you know, like, it was a bad day. So out of frustration, he kind of, he asks Masaki, he's like, listen, I haven't seen much of Hiroshima. This is, this whole, th you know, he's stressed out and he's, he kind of comes to her as a friend and he's like, listen, can you take me somewhere? And I thought it was interesting that she took him to a recycling plant. So instead of taking him to, you know, a tourist attraction, she takes him somewhere very personal and you know even maybe unconsciously without knowing it just to open up and so she takes him here and she kind of explains listen when i left home i used to drive one of these garbage trucks to survive so we learn in this encounter this very pivotal encounter that masaki you know her mother died after their house collapsed and one of the ways she was able to survive is by driving this garbage truck. And not only that, she doesn't have a very good relationship to her family. Like her last name is quite common, she says. She doesn't really know her father. And as we're walking through this recycling plant, like the way it's shot, it just feels, you know what I mean? It's like here you have like a garbage recycling center and it's just, it's pristine, right? You know, like everything about it is clean. And it felt like she took him to like a very special corner. Like, 
I think as a tourist or someone who hasn't visited, you know, this is what you want. You want someone to take you somewhere beautiful and special, like a place that you wouldn't think anybody would go. So he, he's walking around like, I didn't even know that. Like he, he seemed very impressed. And so they have this moment where they're like sharing a cigarette. And again, they have this bond, this unsaid sort of connection where they just kind of understand each other. And Yusuke, again, he opens up not by force, but because she does something, he does something. And he says, listen, by the way, the voice on the tape is Otto's. And he kind of explains his last name, you know, like he has a very rare last name. And he kind of says, okay, does that freak you out that the tape is actually that of my dead wife? And Misaki's like, not at all. Like it just kind of adds context. And the more you find out about someone, the more depth it gives them, right? Because as far as Misaki's concerned, he's just directing. These lines are just, I don't know, it's part of his work. But when she learns that this tape is of his dead wife, her opinion of him changes, right? She's like, oh, there's more going on here than I think. And I like the end of the scene because she walks off. She says, okay, it's time to go. So as soon as he tells her that, she's like, it's time to go. And she's walking ahead and he's walking behind her. And I think he's a person that's more comfortable taking orders than giving them. You know, like he's very, he needs cues, right? His, his wife's infidelity is kind of, you know, he was kind of living in, in reaction. And so now that he's on his own, he doesn't know he doesn't know how to act, really. After this conversation, Misaki comes to watch his audition. And she's in the audience, you know, like out in the open. As if to say, like, this is not my driver anymore. Like, this is my friend. Like, the fact that she was sitting there out in the open, experiencing what he's experiencing was fantastic. And at the end of that day, she kind of thanks him for this. She was, she's about to thank him for this beautiful sort of, you know, like allowing her to watch and in that audition in particular like you're starting to get the sense that the actors are understanding the words because like their performances even if i didn't know what was going on they just felt more real i think masaki was trying to comment on that before koshi came by and was like we need to talk so koshi is fed up so after that odd like rehearsal you know, he's watching all the other actors sort of get into their parts, get into their roles, but he's still at square one. Like he's made no headway in connecting with this character at all. And he's frustrated. So he sits Yusuke down and he says, listen, I'm not right for this part. You know, like I should not be playing Uncle Vanya. And then he goes, why don't you play Uncle Vanya? And Yusuke kind of gives him the runaround and he says, well, he's... in his words, like Chekhov's play, like it, it kind of evokes emotions, emotions that he's not ready to deal with at the moment. And again, he gives him the same advice saying, if you just listen to the words, you'll get the performance that you want. And Yusuke is just looking at him like, like, excuse me, sir, like there's nothing to pull out of me. During what I think would be the best part of the whole movie, Koshi finally gets that heart to heart conversation he's been forcing since the start of the movie. So he's frustrated, right? He doesn't feel he's in the right part. And he tells Yusuke like, listen, why did you cast me? You know, as I said, I'm empty, I'm hollow. And the only person that was able to pull anything out of me was Otto's screenplays. And Yusuke's a bit frustrated. So he looks at Koshi and he's like, okay, let me give this guy what he wants in a controlled effort. So he's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you want to know about us? I'll tell you about us. He says, we had a daughter. She died of pneumonia. A daughter that would be the same age as Masaki. And he says, this time during their life, ended their their happy period you know like it, it just ended everything and he said although they he felt that they were happy and compatible and they really loved each other their daughter's death prompted Otto's not just screenwriting but her affairs with other men and Koshi's face just drops and the way that Yusuke frames it to Koshi is that he's just another he's a footnote in his wife's life like he's a he's a non-presence you know, and as we're listening to Yusuke, a few things came to my mind because he kind of notes at some point that his wife was able to portray him, betray him so naturally, right? Like you wouldn't know it if you looked at them. But at the same time, I was like, sir, you were able to lie so naturally as well. And this is a point that's not lost on Koshi. So Koshi kind of pushes back. He's like, okay, well, why, why didn't you talk to your wife? 
Or like, why didn't you have this conversation? Did it ever occur to you that maybe she wanted to hear you out? Watching Koshi's face, like he really deserved a nomination of some kind because he really is grieving her death, right? He's really like in pain. You get the sense that this kid cannot live on any longer. And you can tell his face shift. Like he, he, he was like, you're not gonna cast me aside like this. Like I wasn't just another one of her life's lovers and I'm gonna prove this point. Because at some point he says, do you have proof? You know, as if to say like, like whatever, we don't have Otto's perspective, but from Koshi's perspective, the relationship he had with Otto was very deep. And so to prove this point, he kind of tries to connect with Yusuke through a story that Otto told him. And at first Yusuke's like, I've heard that story before. And Koshi's like, but do you know how it ends? And the fact that Koshi knew the ending of the story, but Yusuke didn't really suggest that Yusuke's blind spot was never his wife, right? It was always him. So in the story, which starts off, you know, two hours back at the beginning of the film, Otto is working on a story about a young girl who has a crush on her classmate. And every day she would break into his home and leave things behind. This one day in particular, she kind of stays way too long and an intruder enters the house. And the story ends and we don't know who entered the house, but according to Koshi, this, the intruder is a burglar like somebody else breaking into the house. He spots this girl in his room and he tries to assault her. So this young girl in trying to fight for her life stabs this guy in the eye, which is really telling, right? Because Yusuke has glaucoma, right? So there's just a lot of red flags that the story is really about Yusuke. But as the story goes on, this woman, this, this girl stabs him in the eye and runs away. So instead of leaving behind a pair of her underwear or some other trinket, she leaves behind a corpse. And so the next day she goes to class and she's expecting to be confronted, right? She's waiting to be arrested. And what's disturbing is that her classmate, this guy that she has a crush on, he shows up and he seems fine, right? He seems everything is cool. And she starts to doubt her own sanity, right? Like, like what? Did I kill him? Like that really happened. Like he was acting so normal to the point where she was wondering if she was going crazy. And so to, to try and like ease her mind, she goes back to the house. And all of a sudden she notices that she can't get into the house anymore and that there's a security camera. So clearly something happened. How they were able to cover, up, cover it up, we don't know. And so this kind of triggers all this guilt and paranoia and as hard as she tries, she, this, this girl, she has so much guilt, right? Like, although she killed a man. Although he deserved it, she killed him. And so to kind of go on living, acting like everything is fine, acting like everything is natural, is just not something that's natural to her. And so she eventually breaks, she goes back to her crush's home, she looks into the camera and she confesses, right? I killed him. You know, this horrible thing happened, I killed him. And the whole time I was listening to the story, I'm like, this is definitely about Yusuke. Because just before Otto's death, she asked to speak with her husband. And, you know, the sense I got was she was about to just tell him, right? You know, like, especially what you can kind of gauge from the story is that as what, although Yusuke knew about his wife's affairs, Otto knows that he knows. And at some point, maybe she was hoping that her husband would confront her, but he never did. And so as I'm listening to Koshi tell the story, a part of me was like, is he making this up? But I don't think he was. You know, I think like it was really hard to tell. Now, whatever the case, you know, Yusuke is just speechless. Masaki is driving, she speaks is speechless. And then Koshi kind of goes on, you know, he says, listen, you want to give advice? Let me give you advice. And his advice was really spot on. He said, you know what? It's arrogant to think that you can ever understand a person. It's arrogant and it's lazy, right? And he says, the best way to really know yourself is to really understand and listen to your own heart. And this is really the only way you can kind of ease the pain of trying to decipher what goes on in someone else's heart, right? Like, if you are trying to understand the other, not only will you never understand the other, you will never understand yourself. Right? You've kind of lost the ability to even listen to your... You don't even know who you are anymore. You, you want to talk about lines and expressing lines? Look at yourself. And so Yusuke is speechless. They drop him off at the hotel. And automatically Yusuke gets in the front seat with Misaki. Like automatically, as if to say, girl, I need a friend. 
and we drive off and that's the last we see of Koshi. So this conversation between Koshi and Yusuke is important for a lot of reasons because Masaki says something interesting. She says, I don't know, you know, what's motivating Koshi, but whatever it was, it was coming from his heart. You know, like it was his truth. And whether or not it was the truth, I don't know. And she goes on to make the point that, you know, I've known a lot of liars and manipulators in my life and I've had to learn the difference between someone who's being, who's speaking true to themselves and someone who's not. And whatever Koshi was doing, he, he was speaking from the heart, you know. And she was really crying, you know, like, it was intense. And, you know, as Misaki was saying it, we were like, yeah, like I felt Koshi's lines were real and it was the best thing ever. And shortly after, Koshi's arrested for basically causing a man's death. So he's a bit of a hothead and he takes one encounter way too far. And before leaving, he basically bids Yusuke a final goodbye. And the way he bowed in half, I was just like, damn, like he's really done. So Koshi's death seems like it's the end of the play, right? So he has two options. Yusuke can either play Uncle Vanya himself or they have to cancel the play. And so out of frustration, he asks Misaki, like, listen, I need to clear my head. Take me to your hometown. You know, like, I need to, like, this is an emergency. I need to get out of here. And Misaki's like, okay, like, there's nothing there, but I'll take you. So this car ride was beautiful for a lot of reasons because, you know, watching this film, like, there's nothing to disturb you. You know, there's no background characters. There's, there's really nothing to distract you between what's going on between the characters themselves. And you see that in this long drive to Masaki's hometown. And it's a beautiful drive. I love the quietness of the inside of the car to sort of just the, the you know, the road, like the, the noise of the road. And, you know, during this car ride, Yusuke opens up more. And he opens up about the fact that his wife asked him to come home that night. And rather than come home and confront his wife, he chose to take this long drive. And in taking this long drive, he lost all opportunity or hope in ever really getting to the bottom of, you know, why his wife was having all these infidelities, seeing whether or not they could move past it. Because Yusuke assumes that there's nothing anyone could have done, right? He, he really thought like, if, if this ever comes out in the open, we're done. And now he has so much regret, right? Like, what if we weren't done? What if I did this? And Misaki's like, listen, you killed your wife, I killed my mother. And so Misaki opens up about the fact that when their house collapsed, she had an opportunity to save her mother, but she chose not to. And although she loved and hated her mother at the same time, her decision not to save her mother was one that she never wants to forget. And there's a scar on her face, and that scar is very similar to the tape in that, you know, they don't want to forget. And the past is like this anchor, right? Like the scar reminds her of what happened. And in kind of reminding her of what happened, it's, it's weighing her down, right? Because all she sees is this bad thing that I've done, which makes me a bad person. And Yusuke's like, same, sis. Like, I feel you on that. Like, I listen to this tape. You think this is therapeutic for me? And that's the thing about the tape and like, you're wondering like, what is Yusuke getting out of this tape? Like this must be very depressing. And he basically confirms that it is. So I love the transition. So we go from kind of like Hiroshima to snow. And the snow and the quietness of the snow, I mean, there's nothing to distract you, right? And so Masaki has not been home in five years and she goes back and they can, she can see the pieces of her house. Okay, finally we're here. And she automatically starts opening up. And I, I like how these scenes are sort of constructed because there's nothing forced about it. You know, like I don't think Masaki or Yusuke had the intent to open up. And I think it, it's it, in terms of our ability to love, it's interesting because as hard as you try to have a wall up, if that's not natural to you, like it's not natural for us to want to have barriers between ourselves and other people. And that's the sad thing about grief is that you automatically develop this barrier because you want to postpone the grieving process, right? Like nobody wants to, nobody wants to grieve, right? It's a very painful process. It's a very long process. And so you develop these walls and the way these walls just kind of come naturally falling down, it's very well orchestrated, right? Like you never feel it's forced. You know, you just feel like two people 
who kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of just mirror, mirroring each other in some way. So it's here that Masaki feels comfortable enough to discuss her relationship with her mother, this love-hate relationship. And she says any love she had for her mother was in this personality called Sachi. So it seems like her mother had this dual personality and this dual personality only came out in moments of violence. And this Sachi, when she came out, Masaki and Sachi were best friends. They did everything together. And it was to the point where her mother's alter ego was a child. Like, it would, she would mimic a child, she would act like a child. And, you know, the, the intimacy that she wishes she had with her mother, she had with Sachi. And the only reason she wanted to save her mother from that collapsing building was to save Sachi, right? She wanted to save her only friend. Now what, during this time, she couldn't tell if this Sachi was a result of a mental illness her mother had or a result of guilt, right? Something she was doing to make up for her horrible behavior. But whatever the case, Sachi was real. And it was her mother's way of not only expressing love for her, but expressing, you know, kind of coping in this harsh world that we were living in. In telling Yusuke the story, she's asking him to consider like, listen, whatever part of your wife that you want to unpack, maybe it has less to do with her. You know, that like maybe there was nothing to unpack. You know, like it is entirely possible, as horrible as it sounds, that she loved you and she loved other men. And that maybe, just like her mother, this was her way of, you know, kind of coping in this hellish world, right? Like they lost a daughter and maybe this was one of the few ways that she was able to do it. And that doesn't mean she loved you less. It just means, you know, it hurts, but maybe there was nothing behind the curtain. And he's just like shook, right? He's standing there, he grabs her hand. And I, I like the scene when he grabs her hand because they have this father-daughter relationship. And you know, like, I think at one point he says to her, like, if I was your father, I would hug you and make sure that nothing is, you know, like the way he communicates to her, like they're so authentic and they're so thoughtful. You know, they, again, they feel natural. Like this is something he would say to her. So he grabs her hand and he just lets go right he's finally able to unlock these emotions that were in him and he's so overwhelmed right it's like a tsunami that hits him right like at this point he, he's had this measured way of communicating like he's been able to kind of regulate it but after masaki's story like he's just like i got nothing left you know and he 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 admits he admits that he was his blind spot he said he was hurt he was distracted and he actively pretended not to notice. And in doing that, he totally lost touch with himself. You know, he doesn't know where he begins and he doesn't know where he ends. And in losing his wife, he's, he, he fears he's lost all ability to even reconnect with that part of him that he's turned off for so long, right? It became a survival mechanism. He's like, okay, well, I need to keep the act going because I love my wife so much that the idea, you know, this pain is nothing in comparison to losing her. And the fact that he lost her anyways, I mean, it just adds injury to insult. And he hugs her and in hugging her, he's kind of hugging himself, right? He's, he's finally able to confront himself and comfort himself and stop beating himself up. And he says, you know what, those who survive, you know, keep thinking about the dead and in one way or another. And, you know, there's a subtle shift here where rather than use the past as some sort of guilt mechanism, it's kind of like, okay, well, what happened was horrible, but there, there was more good than bad. And the fact that they're both able to kind of open up to each other, you know, they're able to kind of reframe their past as like, okay, well, my past proves that there are future opportunities and I'm gonna take advantage of them. You know, I'm not gonna be paralyzed anymore. Like, it's not gonna be this thing that holds me back. And there's a relief in the end, right? And I, I really love the end of the film because it ends with Yusuke playing Uncle Vanya. And what briefly from what we saw, it seems like everybody was able to understand their lines. And Masaki is watching in the audience, right? She's like gripped. She's like, oof, this is good. Like he really, he really came out of his shell. And Yusuke is reciting the last lines that he would recite before he found his wife's death, before he found his wife dead. And this was a very quiet farewell, right? Like in movies, normally you get a very loud farewell, but in this, you get a very quiet, like, see you later. And that she left Japan, right? This place that's been holding her back. 
and you know just a place filled with grief and that's the thing about our past right sometimes we use it as some type of it's like a very like as a i don't know how to describe it like as an excuse not to move forward as if we owe our past like we, like we owe it to our past to stay in our past like there is that attitude sometimes especially if we look back with regret and all these things and so she's in korea so we didn't see yusuke give her the car but we understand that he gave her the car you know it's a very quiet farewell and it's like chef's kiss right and she has a dog and you know she's driving forward she's moving forward like the the road's going to be tough but she's going to make it through you know overall i think this is a beautiful movie about grief and how people postpone grief and also these walls that we put up right you know sometimes we can be our own worst enemy and assumptions are the the mind killer and you know more so than that like sort of being detached from your own emotions is 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 worse than that is worse than death you're basically dead you know throughout his time with his wife he was sleepwalking and he didn't know it until his wife was dead you know like sometimes we think we have all the time in the world but we don't and masaki you know she didn't you know like you have two characters that have these walls up and again it really speaks to the fact that naturally we're not supposed to have barriers between each other and that sometimes it takes like we want to we want to open up we want to we want to let people in and sometimes we don't know how right it takes the right sort of circumstance and situation and their mutual respect for this car is what allowed them to kind of begin that process so it was a beautiful film so you guys let me know what you think and it's on next time